Alright, good evening everybody. Uh, tonight I'll try not to keep you very long. I'm uh, going to try to eventually make my way over to 2 Thessalonians, uh, the second chapter. And I'm going to start out in the book of Matthew. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try not to be, try not to be very long this evening. Uh, before we get started, we do want to go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word again tonight, dear God. Lord, we pray that it would go out. It would accomplish, Lord, what you would have it to. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And amen. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is the fast approaching return of our Savior. Uh, I think all of us can pretty well see and, and we know that we are, we are not long for this world, that we're going to be going home very soon. And uh, one of the reasons I've been thinking about this this week uh, is actually from the Ebola virus. Now, uh, I'm not telling you that the Ebola virus is the ushering in of the rapture of the church, but uh, it's definitely one of those signs, I think. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit in, in just a little while. But um, in Matthew chapter 24... And starting at the sixth verse, Jesus told us, he says, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. But he said, See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We're, we're there, aren't we? We're there. We hear of wars and rumors of wars. We live in the age of war. It's going on all around us. It's nonstop. But he told us, Be not troubled. These things must come to pass. The end is not yet. And then he goes on to say, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We're there, aren't we? Nation is rising against nation today. Kingdom against kingdom. The world is in huge turmoil. And he says there shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. We are most definitely in this age that... Jesus is speaking of. We see earthquakes today in places where we generally didn't have earthquakes or it wasn't common. It's becoming more common. It's becoming more frequent. It's becoming more powerful. And famine and pestilences. We are most definitely in an age where there is pestilence. Uh, as much as this Ebola thing is scaring people, they are predicting that more people will die of the flu this year than Ebola. But still, yeah, the Ebola thing is a very interesting uh, disease that has cropped up, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. But notice here, after he says that there shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And then in the ninth verse, he says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. Now, we're not quite to this ninth verse, and I believe this ninth verse is going to be fulfilled during the tribulation period, or at least much of this ninth verse when it says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. If we are to look into the book of Revelation, towards the end of Revelation, John says that he looked under the throne and saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And one cannot help but look at this terrorist group named ISIS who is beheading Christians. And we can see all these things are happening. The fulfillment of the ninth verse, I believe, takes place after... The church is taken out of here. So what will the world be like when the church is removed out of this place? Well, if we were to look into 2 Thessalonians and the second chapter, Paul describes these things to us. God gives him direct instruction on what these things will be like. And Paul's instructed by the Spirit of God to write in, 2 Thessalonians, second chapter, he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. 
Paul is instructed to give them comfort concerning the day of Christ, concerning the time when the church will be raptured. <clears throat> there were those at this time at the writing of this book that told the people, well, the rapture's already happened and you've missed it. And you're going to have to endure the tribulation period. And there are also those uh, in modern times that teach and believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation period. And, you know, I'm not saying those people are not saved. I, they, they are saved if they hold to the testimony that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for our sins, that He uh, was resurrected on the third day. But beyond that, I, I don't agree with them on the doctrine that the church will go through the tribulation period. I believe we'll be taken out. I believe there's a lot of different things throughout Scripture that show us that. And just to give you a, a quick few examples, if we were to look uh, before the time of the flood, the Bible says that uh, Enoch walked with God and then he was translated so that he was not. In other words, so that he did not die. Enoch is an Old Testament picture of the raptured church. If we were to go on ahead to the flood, when God's worldwide judgment was taking place in the Old Testament, we have the picture of Noah and his family entering into the ark. And the ark being an Old Testament picture of Jesus. And of course they entered into that ark and they were safely kept. And then, of course, one of the most compelling arguments to it all. Jesus told one of the true churches in the book of Revelation. He says, because, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. He said, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation that shall come upon the world to test them that are upon the earth. So there's, there's so many different examples throughout Scripture, and more so than just that, that show us that I believe that we will not be here during that time. One of them is actually... In this uh, particular chapter. And we'll be looking at it momentarily. So Paul is writing to give them comfort. Concerning uh, the coming troubling times. And actually it's, it's given to us. I believe we are that age. I believe we are that generation. That will see the return of Jesus. There are too many signs. There's too much sin. Too much evil in the world today. For it not to be that time. So he says in the third verse, he says, let no man deceive you by any means. And he tells us something. He says, for that day shall not come. What day? Well, that day that the Antichrist shall be revealed. That day that uh, the church shall be taken away. We're told in scripture that there will be one who will rise on the scene. Who will be able to take control of the earth. Now, how will they be able to take control of the earth? Well, most likely what we are looking at, we are looking at a chaotic event that will take place. I'm not telling you 100% that's what's going to happen. I'm telling you what I've seen in Scripture and also what I've read after other people. Most likely, a worldwide chaotic event will take place. That will bring calamity upon the world. During that time it is believed by me and some others. I'm not saying this is how it is. Just saying this is what I think. That during that chaotic time period. The church will be taken away. There will be mass confusion. There will be mass chaos. And upon that time there will rise one. The Antichrist the Bible calls him. Who will be able to bring peace to the world for a certain period of time. And the reason I say all that is because the Ebola virus kind of reminds me of that. Now, I'm not telling you the Ebola virus is it. I'm just saying it's what it looks like. We're looking at a disease that uh, is spreading. It's killing people. And if it becomes a worldwide epidemic, it is going to be a great way to explain away the rapture of the church. And we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. But beyond that... Whether it's the Ebola virus or whether it's not the Ebola virus. We know that there's coming a time when the Antichrist will rise up when he will be able to take control. But there are some signs. There are some things that are written in scripture that tell us what the world will be like further when he comes on the scene. And Paul says, by the Spirit of God, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except... There come a falling away first. Then it says, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I think that falling away is a twofold falling away. I think number one, I think it refers to the world in which we live. You know, there's the Bible says in this very chapter, in the 11th verse, it says, 
And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But what is going to happen is there, the world is going to have to explain away this rapture, this taking away of the church. They're going to have to explain why all these people are gone. There's going to have to come a man on the scene to take control of this chaos. And this falling away, I believe, is a two... Uh, fold falling away. Number one, I believe it's speaking of the falling away that this world has had in relation to its view and its theology of who God is. Uh, this world in particular, this nation even in more particular, if we are to look and we are very, I guess you could say, somewhat sheltered in the area we live in, although it is it is quickly moving into this area, but in other areas of our country, uh, it is it is more mainstream, it is more acceptable to believe in evolution and to be an atheist than what it is to be a Christian in this day and age in which we live. We had once a generation, we had once a time period where we had the word of God in schools, where we had the word of God in public buildings, where prayer was a common thing. And as we took those things away, as we took them out of schools, as we have taken prayer out of schools, and as we have moved further and further away from godly teaching, we have moved to a generation and to a period of people that no longer believe in God, that no longer believe in a devil, that no longer believe in heaven or hell, but they believe only in materialistic things. And we can see it all around us in the world that we live. It is, you will find that people will be punished more severely for killing a bald eagle than for taking the life of an unborn child. That's the age in which we live. Uh, that is a fine of up to $250,000 and several years in prison to kill the bald eagle. In our country, it is absolutely 100% legal, though, to take the life of the child that is growing uh, in your belly if you are a woman. That is where we are today. We are in a world today. I spoke of this a couple of weeks ago in a message, but I heard a story recently of a missionary in China who went to China to spread the word of God. And she went to, I cannot remember the name of the part of the town that she was in. But this particular place that she was in, it was known to be a place of destitute. It was known to be a place of, of sinful behavior. Men would go there, and I'm not just talking about any men. I'm talking about men who had money, men who had power, men who had the money to buy the things that were sinful, the things that were ugly, that they could engross their flesh in. And she told the story of how that these men would go into this place and they would drink alcohol mixed with snake venom to uh, just give them, just, uh, just make them out of their minds. And she told the story of how that she had to literally pry an 18 month old child from the hands of a man that was sexually abusing this child. This man paid to do this. Paid his money so that he could indulge in this. And there are people that give him the opportunity to indulge in it. She told the story of how she literally went into that place and pried that child from this man as he was doing these unspeakable acts. That's the world that we live in. You won't hear it on the news. You won't hear it on Fox News. You won't hear it on CNN. That is the world that we live. I see it as an EMT. David has seen it, I'm sure, as a police officer. The ugly things that happen in this world. It's there and it's becoming more and more common as we have fallen away from God. The second fold part I believe that this falling away refers to is the last church age that John wrote of in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, he wrote of the last church age, and he says, Jesus told him to write these words, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. He says, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That phrase, not being cold or hot, is an important phrase. What it is speaking of, it's speaking of a supposed church that 
right and wrong, sin and righteousness is no longer black and white, but it's whatever you choose for it to be. Most certainly we live in that church age right now, don't we? Most certainly we live in an age where many churches are compromising, where you can't tell the difference between a church and between a secular organization. They allow anything and everything as to not offend anyone. You know, the problem with not ever offending anyone is this. You never warn anyone about what awaits them in eternity. You never warn anyone about what God says is right and what God says is wrong. This is that church age that John wrote of right before we see him being taken to heaven in the fourth chapter of Revelation where many people believe that he is a representation of the church. So we see here there's a great falling away and then the son of man or the the man of sin shall be revealed the son of perdition. And so Paul continues to write, who opposeth, speaking of the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So what is it that withholdeth him that he might be revealed? Well, he tells us this in the seventh verse. He says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and we are seeing that as everything we've been talking about thus far, how that sin is growing, evil is growing, what once was considered right is considered wrong, what once was considered wrong is considered okay, as long as you think it's okay, that is already working. And he says, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, before I back up, I want to comment on that, that portion there where it says, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Make, make no mistake, as we live in this world, it can be somewhat discouraging to see the things that are going on. But the purpose that God gave Paul of writing this chapter when he told us in the second verse that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. We have looked at the end of the book, amen. We know what it says in Revelation. And we know that one day Jesus is coming back. And just as the Apostle Paul was instructed to write here. That the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. In John's writing in Revelation, John was instructed to write. He says when he sees Jesus coming back, he said he saw a sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. And he smote the armies of the earth with that sword who were led by the Antichrist and the the beast, the false prophet. The Bible says that they were cast bound into the lake of fire and Jesus smote the remaining with the sword of his mouth. So we know that we are the winners. We know what the end is. But we also know what the sign is, and and this is another thing of encouragement. It says here that only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is that speaking of? Well, we know that the world is going to get much worse, but the world is not going to get worse until he who now letteth be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit in the form of the church And his presence here is the one who is restraining right now. The church is the last thing restraining worldwide evil. If the church was not standing up against partial birth abortion several years ago, who would have? If it was not for the church standing up for traditional marriage, who would have? It's the church. But it tells us that before that wicked one will be revealed... The restraining power that the Holy Spirit has and the church will have to be taken out of the way. We live in exciting times because as I look at this thing, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a prophet. I'm not trying to say that, that the Ebola virus is, is what is going to usher in the rapture and the tribulation. I'm not saying that, but it, it excites me to use my imagination And to think about it. It excites me. Because we can look at it. And it could certainly become a worldwide epidemic. Something that will bring chaos. Something that could explain the taking away of the church. And something that could usher in the Antichrist. I find all that exciting. Because any moment now. As Paul was instructed to write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He tells us that there will be a shout. From heaven, 
there will be a trumpet and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, we're, we're right there. We're, we're at the doors of all of this. Jesus, when he gave his discourse on what the world would be like towards the end, what the signs of the times would be, he said, look, he says, you know how that when the fig tree gives its fruit, he says, you, you know that summer's near. He says, so likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. We are right there at the doors. We are right there getting ready to hear the trumpet. And if you're not ready to hear the trumpet, I pray that you would get ready. And dad was talking about uh, Bob's mom. And even Bob himself said the same thing uh, after they were saved. If I'd just known it was that easy. If I'd just known it was that easy. Salvation is by trusting the finished work that Jesus did. What is that finished work? It is his crucifixion on the cross. Him dying in our place. It's him being buried and him raising again that third day. We, we trust in that. That God accepts that for our forgiveness. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything like that for it. God is saying, I want your trust. It's the same thing he said in the very beginning when he told Adam. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. What was God asking for? He was asking for Adam's trust. How was it that Abraham was saved? How was it that Abraham was a righteous man? What was it the word of God says about Abraham? The word of God says that Abraham trusted God. He believed God. And God counted it to him for righteousness. One of my favorite characters in the Bible, David. If we look at David's life, David was far, far, far from a perfect man. But yet, what was it that God said about David when God chose David? And God already knew what David's faults would be. He said, I have chosen me a man after mine own heart. God is looking for people to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He's looking for people to believe that he did send his son to show his love, that his son died on the cross, and that he rose again the third day for our justification. That is what God is asking today. Let's all stand this evening. Let's get a verse of invitation. And if anyone needs to come, we invite you to come. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, dear God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, dear God, for the promise of your return soon. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you watch over us all as we all go our separate ways. Lord, bring us back safely. Uh, give us, Lord, strength and encouragement for this week. Help us to be a light to those that are around us. We thank you. We praise you and we give you glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And amen. All righty. Uh, Lord willing, Tuesday night will be nursing home service at Joe Lynn, uh, 7 o'clock. And then uh, Wednesday night, we'll be back here. We'll be back in the book of Hebrews at 6 o'clock. And Saturday is um, Camden Park. Is that right? Saturday, Camden Park, 5 o'clock, we're meeting at either McDonald's or Everoni's. It hasn't been decided yet. Uh, but Dusty will, and everybody will get that figured out. And I'm trying to think. I think that's it for announcements this week. Am I missing anything? Okay, a little Halloween thing for the kids Wednesday. Um, and we do want to wish Harry a, a happy 37th birthday again. A happy 37 to you. And I think that's it. So uh, all hearts and minds clear. Everybody satisfied? All right, we'll shake hands with each other and you may be dismissed.